<coughs> okay, I'll try, I'll try and present this um, fairly quickly because it's a bit long, but um, I was asked to speak in a Carlton lecture series and they said, could you just talk about your office? Um, and because they say we've got an odd office, so um, <coughs> I said, okay, I would, I would do that. Um, and um, uh, thanks to uh, Graham and Michael, uh, a number of people helped me put some things together and just um, uh, sort of winged it, actually. But um, um, I ended up wanting to talk about how we got to where we are. And uh, um, I'll start this way. <coughs> Um, um, the, the, if you think of what, look at it from, art, from what artists do. So what, what, what do artists actually do? And you can say uh, how, if you think of Damien Hirst and um, sharks in tanks and things like that, and call that art. People have questions about the relevancy of art. Um, the, what, what does modern art do for people? How, how socially um, relevant is it? Um, there's a degree to which we're, we're not actually sure what artists do anymore. And, I use it as an example, um, um, these guys, general idea, and the quote is, the current reality wasn't sufficient for us, we didn't feel like we belonged, so we had to create our own world. And interestingly, these guys as Canadian artists, and this was this is a while ago, so these were, this was 20 years ago, uh, or more, um, uh, they were, uh, they took the idea of their dissatisfaction with what art was about, and said that they would not think about what artists do currently, but what artists should do. And so they started to create a whole career around having events and doing critical reviews and, and, and big parties. And they said, these are all the things that, they, that artists should do. And they created a whole career around that. So not what artists do, but what they should do. So what do architects do? <clears throat> I have the same level of, of uh, dissatisfaction with what architects do. Uh, the OAA is very limiting. Uh, architects tend to whittle away at fewer and fewer things. And it's almost a fetish about the quality of, of houses for very rich people, and that's what architects do. So uh, well, what, what should our architects be doing? How, how more relevant could they be? How could they relate to a larger community? What could they do? And it's interesting, both Edwin and I didn't come from kind of a generation of, of, of uh, different Canadian firms where there was already a built-in mythology about what the firm does. And so we, we decided we'd actually um, investigate things more thoroughly. We'd actually talk about creating our own environment. We'd analyze things carefully. And this is just one example. This was an exhibit we did at Harborfront quite a while ago called Found, Found Toronto. And we're interested in heritage buildings. So we said, well, let's, let's just be straightforward about this. Let's take the oldest map in the city, be very scientific. We, we mapped out all the buildings like butterflies um, to say, here's the ones we think are still existing. We found records to them in the uh, city directories and other documents from the time. And then we went out and photographed them all. That's a very simple exercise. It was kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit. But we found that the buildings that we found that were pre-Confederation buildings on that map, the majority of them weren't actually on the city's inventory of heritage buildings because the city didn't think that those were attractive-looking buildings. So very simple exercise found Toronto. Here's another one where we looked at we said, well, if we're architects, we should actually understand things. And so people were complaining, oh, Toronto's too dense. Toronto, you know, density is horrible. The city's Manhattanizing. So we did an exhibit, another exhibit at Harborfront, where we, where we talked about how you actually figure out density, people per hectare. Then we got people to visualize what a hectare was. Then we actually looked at different areas of the city and figured out what their density is per hectare. And then we compared that to other cities in North, in, in around the world. So for example, Central Paris is much denser than almost anything in Toronto. And so we found that people you talking about density didn't actually know what they were talking about. It, didn't, it wasn't a really <coughs> useful term uh, to consider for uh, urban environments. Well, so arch architects uh, should work in conservation. Um, and we decided we wanted to work in conservation for a number of reasons. I, I, uh, both Edwin and I had very strong, I don't know what that Things popping up. Did I try to get rid of it? It's okay. Um, um, the, the, uh, both Ed and I came from different backgrounds related to conservation. Um, my interest was that if you're talking about what people value and how you connect to a larger society, heritage buildings already have that built in. Those are buildings that people already like. For whatever reason, they like them. They already like those buildings. So they're um, 
um, uh, you can uh, you can have a connection to a community by relating to heritage buildings. The um, Gregory Henriquez was speaking the the it was the previous speaker in this lecture series, and I was saying, Greg is a really great guy, and he, he gave me one of his um, flip books, and he has a flip book, and it shows his project, you, you flip the book, and it shows the Woodward building being demolished and then being reconstructed, and I said, well, that'd be great for our office, but frankly, the only thing would change would be the leaves. Um, the, you know, the, so there's a certain level of, of uh, modesty about heritage that you have to accept that, that your change may be much more... Um, hard to recognize. Uh, but you do get to do interesting things. So here we are um, picking the right color of black for the repainting of the TD center. And you can see that the paint sample, one of the paint samples is off in the far, uh, far left corner. Um, so you're actually engaged with things that you have a sense that you feel that these are significant, important um, things that are happening in the, in the country. Um, uh, much more important than um, than some of the other architecture that's being done in the city. We also think working collaboration is really important, and um, the collaborations uh, both inside and outside the office. So inside the office, and at, at Carleton, then I just rammed off um, Andrew and Scott and Philip and Edwin and, so, and Graham and uh, other people and said, well, in, in the office we work collaboratively, but outside the office, the, the idea of the architect being the sole kind of big designer, like uh, Howard Rourke from um, you know, that um, Anne Rand novel, uh, we find it's much more beneficial and that architecture is much more complicated, so you can actually work with, in, with other architects to produce interesting things. So this is Shim Sutcliffe. Uh, we contributed by uh, making sure that the old building was retained. The sisters of St. Joseph wanted to demolish it originally. Um, and then we brought interesting techniques to it. So this is a building that we covered with a color wash, uh, uh, which was, I think, the first time in maybe 100 years that the color wash technique had been used in, in Toronto. We used uh, part of the original recipe, which included a lot of stale beer. So we're bringing something in a collaborative, but we can do that with lots of people. So this is with KPMB, and this is where we're stitching together uh, a heritage building um, and uh, doing kind of complicated things to it, which is actually about uh, the bigger project is is um, stitching back together a section of Young Street. So it's not just about the project, it's about, about uh, the urban environment. So <coughs> um, one of the things I think architects should do is establish value. And, and this is a quote from Andrew Monroe uh, from his, his book on museums. And he said, in our museums, we accept only torsos. The idea that, that values are arrived at by individuals and they say, this is what society thinks is important, is something that we should be recognizing. So Andrew Monroe was a um, major character in, in um, strengthening uh, French culture, which was already pretty strong, uh, French culture for about 40 years. Um, and he did some very um, um, important writing about how cultures relate to um, the, th the things that they value. And so when we look at value, we look at things like, well, let's look at the, here's the, the ROM, uh, which uh, got very rough press when it first came out. Uh, many people were critical of it. It's still getting rough press today. Uh, the, the head of the ROM is resigning. Um, the, um, uh, there's people have automatically, you can be in the elevator and you can say, do you like the AGO or do you like the ROM? They go, I, I love the AGO, I hate the ROM, ROM's stupid. Um, and so the, the, there's a whole value set that happens there, which I think we as, as um, educated professionals need to question. And the reason for that is that if you look at, if you look at something like Robart's library, you can see that values change over time. Values actually aren't embodied in the buildings. They're actually the, the values that we um, place on those buildings, and that those values change over time. And I put this quote in from Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu is a really important sociologist or, um, who uh, has written a lot about class and taste. Um, and um, Jokingly, you know, people have said, "Well, they disagree with him," and he turned around and said, "Well, it's, that's so typical of your class." Mm -hmm. 
uh, and he, he, he actually kind of evolves um, everything to a kind of relativist position. This quote, free thought must be won by an historical an anamnesis, is a, um, he's basically saying, well, if all, ta if all taste comes from your class and your education, then how can you actually break out of that and understand other people's points of view? And so he uses this, this word. Anamnesis um, is um, a word from Socratic dialogue. So what happens is that you know Socrates would ask you a question, and you would, for some reason, you didn't know before, but somehow, you, because he asked you that question, you actually figured out the right answer. So something came out of you to say, hey, I actually understood the Pythagorean theorem, or something like that. Um, and so he's saying he has, has, these ideas have to come from you. So you, and, and I would suggest architects in drawing and mapping and, and visualizing things actually have a way to approach free thought. And so here's another building that, um, you know, Robert's Library, I think, is something that people are now beginning to appreciate because it's about 40, 50 years old. This building, everyone loves it. It's a Richardsonian Romanesque building, la, 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 la. But from the time it was built in the 1880s until the 1960s, it was reviled. Uh, most people hated the building, thought it's stupid, uh, very badly detailed, clunky, uh, overly wrought, uh, Victorian, uh, clumsy, um, bad, bad functioning, we never had enough space in it. Um, all of those values were the values that we lived with for um, the first 50 years, or 60 years of its life. Uh, and only later, when, when a bunch of students got out and started washing it, uh, so you could get all the grime off it, um, did people start to say, well, this might be actually a really interesting uh, building. And our whole, uh, you can take the whole shift of, of uh, Victorian architecture um, uh, has gone through that whole uh, renewal. Sorry. Um, so the idea that values are relative um, is something that we we basically understand from a philosophical point of view, but still with things like heritage, we tend to think, well, these things are just real values. Uh, something's very important. Um, something's um, uh, something's authentic. Uh, something's original. Um, something's more significant than something else. And in fact, those are all ideas that we um, uh, we generate, and architects actually generate those senses of value. So the truth is a mobile army of metaphors. Is something that you can apply to uh, art theory, architecture theory, but it also applies to uh, politics. And so we we did a little test case uh, a number of years ago. Um, this was 2008, and and Graham and I worked on this. Well, everybody worked on this, but um, uh, a little test case, basically to test out the Nietzsche um, theory. Um, we picked. Um, of the concrete buildings of the city at a time when they were all reviled. It was basically, if you walked in an elevator, someone you said you're an architect, they'd say, don't you hate Robert's library? Um, you must hate Robert's library. Um, and so we picked all the buildings that we thought people didn't like, the time period they didn't like them, and we got people to write about them. We didn't, and we had about 60 authors. Um, we didn't um, try to create a canon of, of um, kind of firmly disciplined canon about these buildings are very important. We just wanted people's opinions about them. And they were remarkably different from the status quo of all these buildings are ugly. So that was a kind of um, an anamnesis. So here's, no, here's another way to look at, at um, how things attain, attain value. And this is, I swiped this from Julian Smith. Um, this is an evolution of, of how people have looked at heritage value. Um, the um, if you looked back at the early part of the 19th century, there was an antiquarian bias was based on kind of ideas about archaeology. Only the things that were really, really old, uh, usually ruins or uh, monuments, were regarded as having any heritage value. Um, and this is the, the masonry from St. Marie among the Hurons. But from the antiquarian bias's position, there'd be very, little, very few things in North America that would be um, uh, it was very European-based for value. Um, then in the latter part of the 19th century, started to develop uh, something that could be called commemorative value. You didn't actually have to have anything there. You could just say this was the site of a battle or it could be something you could, you could it, was this, it was what actually happened at the event that was important. I picked Fort York because Fort York 
was restored in the 1920s, and at that time it was very much about the War of 1812. So they went around and demolished anything built after the War of 1812. So they demolished some very beautiful 1830s buildings because they said, well, these just don't fit with the commemoration. Um, and they also rebuilt things uh, from scratch just because they said these things were there at the time of the War of 1812. So the commemorative bias tends to be uh, about nationalism, uh, building, building a national identity, and about militarism. Um, and I would say, you know, our prime minister is still in this position. The, the next thing is that the next bias has been since the 60s or 50s has been tourism and economic bias. And, and the idea is that, that things are of value if, they, if tourists will come to them. And so Parks Canada uh, highlights uh, all these things that they say, well, these are the really important things in the country because uh, they, they're tourist economic generators. We think of beautiful ads from Newfoundland and Labrador. That, uh, uh, there's really a sense that the things that are very significant in, in, uh, in the landscape are these things that are tourist-based. But in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, there's been a sense uh, that, in fact, things that are important are not only for tourists, but they're for the people who actually live there. And Julian's called this an uh, ecological bias. So it's, in a sense, it's put a much larger, um, uh, uh, much more, a larger landscape. And currently, um, the uh, groups like ECMOS and uh, other international groups are saying it's even larger than that. So this is a statement from Britain, New Heritage suggests and instead of finding the best, calling it heritage and fighting to keep it, we should look with open eyes at all that exists, except that at some level it is all heritage, and then decide how best to use it for social and future values. This might involve traditional preservation, or it might not. And so there's, this is, um, um, Graham had been the head of um, um, the, the trust in Britain, and this uh, very much fits with what's called the Faro um, International Charter, uh, that was adopted by the European Council and Canada's connected to the European Council um, as, a, as an approach to heritage. It means that we're still going to look after things kind of an artifactual level, protecting things that we think are really valuable. But at the same point, uh, there's all these other things that have, va have value. Uh, they may have value for small communities and lots of other things. Um, it's a crisis for heritage because if you think everything has to be preserved <coughs> in the same way, how do you actually deal with this larger looking at a much ur larger urban scale. And so here's another way. This is another way to look at value. Um, it's not only that ar architects um, uh, assess value at a current time, but we're actually living with things that have had different values placed on them at, at different times. So I, I'll go through this quickly, but this is a comparison between the ROM and the AGO as the evolution of values associated with an institution it thinks it is. So. This is the first generation of architects, uh, and when they were building, when they were so both by Darling and Pearson, um, and uh, when they originally built uh, at the beginning of the ninth, uh, beginning of the 20th century, they basically developed uh, from a Beaux Arts plan. Uh, they assumed that Beaux Arts plan, a kind of Durand plan, was exactly what you used for museums, and they would have uh, internal courtyards. Um, and art would be displayed, and there was no kind of functional plan that said, you know, here's where this goes or that goes. It basically would all fit into this Beaux Arts plan. Um, and the blue parts are the parts that actually got built. Um, so Walker Court at the AGO was part of originally an intended uh, larger yard. This, this was the build up plans as proposed. So the AGO had uh, two, had three um, uh, skylit courts, and uh, the, the ROM had two. And then the second uh, generation of architects, the, the ROM, uh, was during the 1930s. And at that point, it moved away from being a Beaux-Arts uh, academic plan to being something about um, relating to the public. So during the period of the Depression, the idea was this would be a palace for the public. People, everybody could go there. It's going to be a broad, um, um, open public institution. The AGO was a little later. It was 1960s when actually had a second work by Parkin. Uh, and at this point, the, there was no pretense about keeping the Beaux-Arts plan anymore. What it was really about was, again, making it very, very public, uh, having black box environments where uh, art could be exhibited uh, under electric light. Um, and so here's the, the, 
the ROM. And here it's it's no longer just an academic institution, it's actually a palace for people um, so that everyone could feel that they, uh, during the period of the Depression, that they still had some things that were strong and important. Here's the AGO, and you can see um, Walker Court had was all skylit, and at this point, mm -hmm. when the parking expansion happens, all the skylights are closed in, um, and you get large uh, environmentally controlled spaces for for visitor experience, um, and it gets a very large public front uh, onto Dundas. The original scheme was actually to knock down everything else on the south side of Dundas, so this would stand proud, uh, and it was very public and popular. So you can see the the um, King Tut exhibit pieces on the front. Another generation of architects. So the, the, the public thing had been dealt with in the, the, the swing uh, for the next generation of architects was they need to be more serious as professions, so they need huge curatorial spaces at it. So never had curatorial spaces, so where all the stuff would happen behind. And they all, also, now it's public, but they want to raise money, so they had to have event spaces. So both institutions build big curatorial wings and event spaces. And you can see the, the planetarium kind of stands in as another black box experience that was the, the idea about what a museum would be at that time. And so here's the the, the ROM uh, filling in its public spaces in, in its uh, its courtyards. Curator went to the south and terraces that were for uh, vents and, and uh, rentals and things on the north side. And the AGO um, again creating uh, event space um, and um, um, uh, and a curatorial wing. Okay, now the fourth generation of architects. Um, uh, the swing, the institutions were, the event spaces weren't exactly working. Um, the, the new mandate for a museum it had to reinvent itself again. And at this point, it's about being very urban and public, uh, being transparent uh, to the community, being uh, um, showy so that it actually stood out as a landmark, uh, and having more exhibition space clearly defined. And so th that's what the, uh, the, the ROM um, very clearly did all those things. The transparency was not only in the, new, in the new part, but all the windows were opened back up again uh, in the older part of the building. So that the, the um, again, it was, you should be able to see the exhibits, but also look out to the city. And the, in plan, uh, the Beaux-Arts plan uh, was restored. The things that had been put in the way were removed. And uh, this is the landscape plan, which is the fifth generation of work. Um, and this is, again, making the buildings even more urban by making a connection to the exterior and the sidewalk. This is Harry Ponterini and, and Claude Cormier, uh, work around the room. Then this is the AGO, uh, and it's, uh, it made itself very public by making a big box uh, that was visible from the downtown core. Um, and the north side, um, this is an early model of a titanium um, wall that actually lays down on the street. So it actually have a titanium street. Um, and so the, the intent of these, these moves were to make, um, make the institutions much more urban, much more connected to the larger community. The exact opposite of what museums had thought they were earlier with the black box experience. Um, there were earlier models that actually uh, the, the AGO went through lots of models, and this is a model that would, would have demolished the uh, Moore um, um, Gallery. Uh, those things were easily put aside, and both institutions um, took the idea that they should actually show the evolution of all the things that have happened on their sites, so that at each place there's, an example, there's references to uh, all the early designers, and in fact, at, at this point it was decided at the AGO that major parts of the parking scheme should be kept intact. And um, so both of the schemes um, uh, looked at orientation, making orientation very clear. Um, and Gary's team took the Walker Court as the key part to make all the orientation happen. So you go there, and that's how all the circulation happens in the, in the space. The previous schemes, the, the earlier schemes, hadn't really addressed uh, circulation well. So <coughs> that's a kind of little digression, but and this is the this is now the AGO's landscape scheme, which is um, is just underway at the moment. So that's a digression, but it's saying that historically um, the values even for institutions change. So almost everything we're looking at goes through its own um, 
um, change of, of values. Uh, similarly, the, the distillery district um, uh, was a place of industry, a big part of the city, uh, huge amounts of nostalgia connected to it, different values associated to it, um, a number of, uh, uh, we all kind of now have has created a kind of iconic sense of it, that it's a fantastic place to go to, everyone loves it, but when we were starting off earlier, uh, people were saying, well, gee, it looks like Auschwitz to me. Um, and so there's different kinds of values that could be associated with it. Uh, we decided not to follow the, the route of nostalgia, but said, in fact, there should be different types of authenticity here, authenticity with the old buildings, but authenticity with all the new work. So all the new work should kind of read uh, uh, clear and, and straightforward, and the layering of value should be heritage buildings layered with arts and culture and, and uh, new and interesting things on the site. And you couldn't see um, any um, artifact uh, without seeing it in this larger urban context. So this is a plan from uh, um, a number of years. And how old is this? This is probably like six years old. Six. Five? Uh, ten years. Ago. Ten years. Because all the white buildings are buildings proposed for construction. Um, and the distillery sits as a great piece in the middle. Um, those, all the white buildings now, if you took a more recent model, you'd find that they're even larger. So there's a lot of 40 and 50 story buildings being proposed. <coughs> so we find that the, 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 the sense of what the distillery is like needs to continually evolve and change as its environment changes. And so there are proposals for this, this model shows one tower on um, the distillery site. There are now three, and there's a proposal for two more. So what about other other places that have um, uh, no apparent value? They're kind of, or, or, they're, or they're not liked. Um, and uh, this is one of um, J uh, Jesse Jackson's photographs <laughs> of the suburbs. And I think we as an office have uh, really question if, if we as architects only deal with things in the downtown core, we're somehow missing a larger picture. And if we're only relevant in the downtown core, um, we're, we're actually missing a larger kind of societal uh, need. And so uh, Graham has been doing some fantastic work in the suburbs, and was Graham your thesis, but to, to look at these neighborhoods that are um, undervalued. And uh, this was, this is a very, Simple map, but actually it was the it was the aha moment for many people when you saw all of these um, 1950s, 60s apartment towers mapped. Um, and again, it's maybe like Graham Fairclough's um, looking with open eyes, or maybe it's like an anamnesis. But the 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 looking at the city from this perspective of the downtown core uh, seeming not so important compared to the rest of the city, and there being so much of this uh, kind of development, it it's led to kind of um, um, simple figures to say things like um, Toronto is extremely dense, the suburbs are very dense. Uh, it gives itself twice the density of, of um, the kind of same uh, topography in, in Chicago. Um, it creates a different kind of character for Canadian cities that American cities don't have. Um, these buildings constitute half of the rental housing in the city of Toronto. Um, and so we've as good architects, we've come forward and said, well, let's uh, let's look at revalorizing these properties, um, seeing how they can be uh, assessed and looked at. Um, and I think we've significantly changed um, people's approaches to these neighborhoods. So even, even the mayor, uh, John Tory, had to come out and say, I really support tower renewal, uh, which I think is good. We'll see what happens with that. And we've now had this a rezoning happen, so architects can actually affect rezonings. So we've had a rezoning, a new zoning category created in the city of Toronto, and 500 clusters of these buildings have been rezoned um, to to allow for uh, uh, modest amounts of mixed use. Uh, we also throw parties, just like General Idea, um, and in that case, we can actually look at something something else. So this is the party where we compare Toronto to Detroit. And again, we're dealing with issues of stereotype and, and values that um, are, are prejudicial but not considered. And so we're still going through an exercise of comparing Toronto to Detroit. We're hoping Detroit throws us a big party, we can go down there, um, and uh, continue to look at 
how we can reassess and understand values at different places. And so when we have these parties, it's not a point that we're pushing and saying, well, we actually know what the value is. We don't know that. We have to kind of explore it, understand it, see where these things work. And so it's not, it's a kind of set of pre, pre-canonic uh, associations that we're, we're considering. And then um, if, again, if, uh, if it's all about cities, why can't we look at smaller environments? Um, and this is Philip's work um, in Newfoundland, Philip and Andrew's work in Newfoundland, um, where we're looking at very small communities and we're saying, well, you know, Richard Florida says, you know, culture is generated by the major cities of the world. We're saying, well, in fact, uh, what about quality of life and what about the culture of these very small communities? Let's understand that experience. That, so we've been taking students there uh, to kind of um, um, shared experience. The students are learning something. The communities are actually uh, very um, um, interested in the fact that people are showing interest in their communities. And this is a build that those students have done in um, so kind of rest spot. It's a, it's a historic route from one town to another town. Um, and this is a, a kind of way station that the students have built there. And so um, um, we we do all these pro- we do these projects and we call them research and development. And um, people ask, well, why you know why would an architecture firm bother to do any of these things? And uh, my position was that that um, uh, you know if we were if we were doing haute couture or if we were, were pastry chefs, or if we are making tires, or any, you would have a research and development arm because you want to figure out how to do your work better. I, I actually can't figure out why architects find it novel that we do research and development when it's, I think it's kind of what we should be doing. Um, and so what does an architect do? I think they study uh, and understand the, the environment that we have constructed, uh, and look forward to how, how to build that as a stronger, environment. Uh, we create habitation, accommodation, um, not just for individual people living in rich houses, uh, but for society at large. And we create things that are, are uh, related to buildings and gardens, uh, but we also create, and those are tangible things, but I think we also create intangible things like Nietzsche's metaphors. <laughs> So that's, 